You're listening to The Frequency of Creativity with Melinda Har Curley. Welcome everyone to The Frequency of Creativity, where we are at the intersection of energy and art. I'm your host, Melinda Har Curley, and to see how art can bring joy and understanding and life force energy into your life, sign up for my newsletter at melindaharcurley.com. You'll see my latest work and have links to the latest podcast. Today, I am really excited to talk with the figurative painter, Joanne Landis, on A Woman's Voice. Welcome, Joanne. Thank you. Welcome to my studio. (laughs) Well, and for those of you on YouTube, you could see a sample of Joanne's work and just how vibrant and alive and Joanne primarily works with the female figure. So uh, I would highly suggest going on YouTube so you can get a sample of what her work looks like. So Joanne, you started as a poet then you were a fashion illustrator, and now you're a figurative painter. You were a fashion illustrator for 12 years in New York and London. You were also a model, a stylist, a set designer, an actor, a writer. I was busy. <laughs> <laughs> and I think all of that really informs the work in your painting now, and that you've been so successful. You went to Parsons School of Design. You taught at the Fashion Institute of Technology. You've had a number of solo shows, group shows in galleries from New York to San Francisco. And you've had many awards, fellowships and prizes. You've been featured in art and antiques, traditional home magazine, the San Francisco Chronicle. And you also did a TED Talk. So- Congratulations on all of your accomplishments. Um, Joanne, so the first time I became familiar with your work was a show that you did at the Belfont Art Museum called Persephone, Persephone. So why don't you tell us about that show? It was an excellent show. Thank you. It was um, an interesting project that I did with uh, another artist, another figurative painter, um, Elodie Geikus. And we both work with women, we both work with with mythology, but she's a much more of a realist painter than I am. And so the two styles, my work is much more stylized and expressionistic. Uh, We were talking one day just about art and being in the world and it just came up that, why don't we do a collaboration? And um, we settled on the myth of Persephone. We decided to do it in panels instead of just one canvas. Mm -hmm. Um, Her father was a carpenter, so he was able to set up the screen that we wanted to show it. And we ended up doing uh, this project over a year and a half. And we worked on four panels at once. And the work would go back and forth. I would do some work on some moving the mist forward, Mm -hmm. and then, but in an unfinished state, and then it would go to her and she would work on it and then it would come back to me and I'd work on it again and then it went to her and she'd work on it again. And then over this year and a half, um, we ended up with the 12 panels. Um, and tell, going, the, tell the audience how big these panels are. Oh, it's about, it's probably about 48 feet in length by the time it was done. Mm-hmm. And it was set up at the Belfont Art Museum. And this was amazing because we hadn't measured the room that it actually encircled the entire room so that you were immersed in the myth. I don't know how that happened, but it was intuition or something. So you walked into the room and you were surrounded by the story, which was really, was very intense. Mm -hmm. And it was highly colorful. And um, we went through the stages of um, the birth of Persephone with the uh, goddess Demeter who was the goddess of earth and the kidnapping of Persephone and the end of spring and summer as earth dies because Demeter is so brokenhearted mm-hmm. at losing her daughter and then went all the way around. And we got um, to show it there for several months, which was wonderful. And then we got a second showing at the Susquehanna Art Museum in Harrisburg. 
And that was, instead of a circle, they showed it in a long arc. Mm -hmm. So you could walk it. It was interesting to see how differently people responded to it mm -hmm. by kind of walking through the panels as opposed to kind of being surrounded by it. So it was a really intense project. It was actually our second collaboration. And we had never seen it all together until it was installed. Mm. And we were actually jumping up and down. <laughs> we were like, I can't believe we did this. I mean, it was a big, big project. And, and kind of terrifying to work with another artist. It really puts you to the test, mm -hmm. you know, because she is an excellent artist. And she to, is. to really come up with the right level of work that matches and moves it forward was really it was a, a great learning experience. So, yeah. Well, and I just feel so fortunate that I was able to attend the show. And as soon as you walked in the room and you're right, the work dominated the room. Yeah. So as soon as you walked in, you were really immersed in just the energy and the mythology. Yeah. And I love how you titled it Persephone, Persephone. Yeah, and we did that because um, to incorporate both of us and that we didn't choose, I'll do this figure and you'll do that figure. It moved back and forth. So we both sometimes, I mean, painted the Persephone character, sometimes the other. So um, yeah, we didn't kind of plan it out totally. And we did miss like the final panel where Persephone has to return to the underworld again and fall starts again, but we left it on a happy note. So okay. it's summer. And so how was the experience, because that's not a common experience. So how was it to work so interactively with another figurative painter? And she's much more realistic right. than you are. But the two of you, whatever you did, worked and worked beautifully because it merged seamlessly. Well, um, I said this in another talk that we did that it wasn't a competition. It was a collaboration mm -hmm. so that we we were not fighting each other. Mm -hmm. And hopefully we're both generous of spirit you know, to be able to tolerate and encourage another work. Mm -hmm. And like I said, this was our second collaboration. The first one that we did, we just did a figure on an empty canvas and gave it to the other person. Mm -hmm. And that went back and forth and we each completed each other's painting. So we had a taste of it before we did this huge project. Mm -hmm. And it was really how exciting that was that led to the idea mm -hmm. um, as we attended the opening for that first show, we got a request to do a show for Belfort, like to actually design something for them. So it's the art museum. So we just went ahead. Great. Well, Joanne, um, I'm so sorry. We're going to have to take a short break, but before we do, can you please share with the listeners where they can find out more about you? Well, I have um, a Facebook page. If you look at Joanne Landis Artist, and um, I actually don't monitor it. Someone else monitors it for me, but you can see a variety of work and also some mini films that have been done. And you can also go to, um, to Google. I did a TEDx talk in 2019 in Williamsport, which hopefully you'll be able to access. Um, it's me talking about the process of becoming a painter mm -hmm. and also standing in front of one of my paintings. So you can see that. And then you're also represented by Art House in San Francisco, Francisco, right? Yeah. So that is, um, I've been with them for over 20 years, and now it's an online um, gallery rather than a physical space gallery, but they're still uh, incorporating my work in their, right. in their files. Well, thank you. And please stay with us as we talk much more with Joey and Landis about a woman's voice. We're back with the frequency of creativity where we are at the intersection of energy and art. We're talking with the figurative painter, Joanne Landis about a woman's voice. So Joanne, when we look at your background as a fashion illustrator, as a model, as a stylist, all of those experiences seem to inform what you're doing now and just you embracing the female form. 
Well, I spent um, 12 years as a fashion illustrator and then also taught designers to draw fashion. And because I was a model, I, at the time, is understanding it from the inside. So it's not just the outside. So when I paint now, one of the reasons that I switched from illustration to paint is trying to do work more in depth. I was very lucky when I started working, there were a lot of young art directors that were doing experimental stuff. <laughs> and um, anyway, so I got to do the drawings that I wanted to do. And that was amazing that someone would pay me to draw, which I love to draw. Mm -hmm. So that was a miracle in my life. But at a certain point, um, I felt that I wanted to do something that was in a way more taxing and uh, drew on a lot of the things that I think about and experience and get that into um, a canvas, which is much more workable than paper. And um, so when I first started, I didn't really know anything about painting, although I had the occasional, like when I was in school, you would have a life painting class and a mm -hmm. life drawing class. But I had years and years and years of drawing the body. So without kind of knowing how to paint mm. too much, I knew the body. So that was what I used as in the beginning as my vehicle to enter the painting as I learned how to paint, which took like several years to be able to be comfortable with the medium and what it can do. And so um, working with the figure and then trying to get inside the work not doing what I call other people's paintings, not mm -hmm. trying to copy what's already been in the world, but to really do something that felt like it was mine, mm -hmm. which I was able to do with drawing. Like the drawing to me was like, I, I used to say it was like flying. It came so easily. Mm -hmm. So with painting, it began to be more and more going deeper and deeper into the work to the point where I thought I was working for a half an hour and it would be three hours, like getting into that kind of meditative state with the work was when the work really started to alter. And what I found is I was reaching for archetypal figures, like that, not just things that were contemporary, but mm -hmm. going to, you know, hopefully something that is eternal and deep and universal mm -hmm. in a woman. So it's not just and this is how I feel today, but this is a feeling that I hope is common and accessible. And so I may go through a lot of gyrations with the work in building the painting. Mm -hmm. And I think I told her figures come and go. You know, I don't start with a set idea. I really am just kind of following the painting. Mm -hmm. So that was a new process for me is not to have any, um, preconceived ideas about what the painting is going to be about, kind of let it take its shape. And um, figures come and go, the story comes and goes, the color changes until finally something feels like it is on track. And that's a point where I start to feel I can really get into the work. You know, so well, and what really struck me, I was lucky enough to listen to one of your gallery talks when at one of your uh, figurative shows. And one of the thing, one of the many things that really struck me about your work is that you really took us through the process of a painting, how many iterations it goes through. Like I, I distinctly remember one painting, there was a figure that was standing in the middle, then you turned it around, then turned it around again, and then painted another figure, and then painted another figure, then took that figure out. Then the yeah. original figure ended up reclining across the bottom. And so you look at your work through so many perspectives, not only intellectually and emotionally, but also physically as you turn that canvas around a lot. Well, I, I'm struggling with sometimes there's a story that seems I wanna tell, mm -hmm. but it's not working. And I'll stay with it as long as I can stay with it. I mean, I've been weeks, day after day after day on a canvas and then one day saying, okay, this is not happening. And then I'll turn it around and I'll start another figure in another direction. But sometimes the underpainting, there'll be a line that's a horizon line from the one painting and oh, that just suits the arm mm -hmm. of the figure that I'm putting in. And so I'll keep, instead of 
painting out the underpainting or making it white. I just work right on top of the color and the lines that are there. And sometimes they will blend in or there'll be pieces left over from there'll be color or pattern or something left over from the previous painting that makes a kind of sense in the new painting. Mm -hmm. And also I think on one level adds a magical quality to it because there are, there's a sense of things underneath the surface, things kind of coming through from another level. Mm -hmm. um, I did one painting, a very huge painting in here, it kind of went around the walls and it was called In the Temple and it meant in the temple of the body. And again, working with the body and going from um, almost abstract shapes to um, acknowledging a life and death shape, like in life there's death and then going through animism and Buddhism and Eastern philosophy and finally Western philosophy. And none of this was a thing that I thought it was only like three or four figures into the painting mm -hmm. that I got a sense of what this painting could be about. Like I'm just kind of trying the figure out, trying this out and moving it into a space and looking for something that connects and makes a narrative to me. And that kind of pushes the painting forward. Um, so, Joanne, in listening to you talk, um, does each painting have its own, well, and you just said that each painting and each figure has its own narrative, but share with us, how do you tap into or how do you connect with or how does the narrative or the figure emerge through your process? Well, um, besides just the labor of working with a figure and seeing the figure in a particular way, like the exterior body represents the interior body. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I'm conscious of is the exterior, the environment is also part of the figure. You know, what's happening in the figure should be represented in the environment as well, in the coloration. But in my process, I learned to use music as a really important tool. Mm -hmm. And um, I may work with a particular piece of music over and over for months as I'm working on a painting. So I come into the studio, I put on that piece of music and I sit with the painting and I wait until literally I'm moved to get up and work. Mm -hmm. You know, as opposed to, I think I'll do this, you know, arbitrarily, it's, it's kind of um, like on marriage you know, where I'm able to come up to the rhythms of the painting that are mm -hmm. already there and then go in and, and start working in a way that is still conducive to whatever the story has been. And that took me a while to learn. Mm -hmm. You know, before it was, I'd go in and like kill a painting, you know, mm -hmm. be so anxious to do something on it or something that I thought and it really meant the loss of a kind of naivety or, or something that was in the painting that was really the strongest part. So I use very hypnotic music that have rhythms that go over and over. So um, I'm listening to some music from Mali. I'm mm -hmm. listening to some Ukrainian music now with the piece that I'm working on. Um, I've listened to Afro-Cuban music. It's not stuff that's just dreamy. It's just, just things that have a kind of rhythm that keeps you in a place as opposed to going high and low and changing, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes Baroque music, mm -hmm. whatever mu mood that I'm in that starts to work with the painting. And then I use that as a way to, to get in and out of the painting also. So that's part of it. And the other thing is, even though I'm working with a figure, I don't want you to just look at the figure and say, oh, this painting is about this, mm -hmm. or this face looks sad, so this must be a sad painting. I want that to be in the environment as well. So it's more than just what's contained within the outlines of the figure. So, And in looking at your work, it, it's very, the figures themselves are so integral to the painting itself. And it is there so integrated. And when you're talking, what I'm thinking about, I'm taking lessons right now. And what you're talking about is right where I am. So my teacher is like, you really have to slow down. And so I paint really fast, mm -hmm. really fast. 
So in going from working with really heavy bodied acrylic right. to working with a watered down acrylic and just pouring it on the canvas. So I'm finding I'm becoming in slowing down, which is really hard for me. Yeah. Um, becoming much more in tune with myself and with the painting and just what you said, it opens up so many other avenues that I know that I missed in my frenzy yeah. with the palette knife. Yeah, I understand that. I, I say I'm more of a sprinter than a marathon runner, but I learned to slow down. And, and part of the process is that has been helpful is having this studio. Um, I have a studio at home mm -hmm. where I'm working daily and this in the pajama factory is kind of far away and I only get here once a week. And so I have to, um, again, do a much more meditative start to the painting because I haven't seen it for a week. It's yeah. new to me. Yeah. But the other thing is I started working with um, patterning and to just slow down and not race through it and try to be meticulous because I'm much more of an expressionistic painter, messy and, you mm -hmm. know, overpainting and things like that. Um, I want to say about this, this is a older piece, but um, a lot of the things that I'm experiencing in my daily life go into the painting. I used to say, well, if the phone rings, I'll put a phone in the painting, you know, but it really was, um, I was reading Odysseus, I was reading Homer, mm. and I said like, oh, I have to do, um, you know, a painting, and I did this huge painting, and then I needed to do a second one, and this is the second one, and then I needed to do a third one, and then there's a third one, but um, it's using, um, I'll go back, like as I go into the second painting and bring elements that occurred in the second painting back into the first mm -hmm. to hook them up. Like I was just remembering these um, chains that I did the anchors, where are they? Here they are. Start to move through all of the paintings to connect them mm -hmm. and certain colorations and patterns. I'll go back to the first painting mm -hmm. and put that in. Mm -hmm. So it's never done until it's done. Mm -hmm. You know, you're just always, um, looking for another level of work. But I did want to say that this is, you know, sirens and drowning sailors basically was uh, what the painting was about. Well, and Joanne, and listening to you too, um, there's no, art is such, art is your life. Yeah. So there's not this barrier of you separating your professional life and your personal life. It's so integrated for you and what you just said, what's happening in your everyday life becomes part of the painting. Yeah, it may not stay there forever, but it goes in and may come out. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing is I don't, hopefully feel I have an agenda with the painting. I try to make, it's almost like each painting starts from zero. You know, it's not like, oh, I should do a painting like the last painting I did. I've tried that and it never works anyway. So it's always starting from zero to see what is gonna occur on the canvas now, mm -hmm. like using the now. And when I have a show, I call the pieces that work together. Mm -hmm. So I'd rather do, all the work spontaneously and just as it will come out and mm -hmm. as often as you know as big as small as whatever mm -hmm. and then just put together a show that makes a kind of sense as opposed to pre-editing mm -hmm. the work in a way when i did commercial work i had to do that mm -hmm. i had to show a client what the finished product was going to look like before i did it mm -hmm. and then i had to commit to that i couldn't mm -hmm. go home and have a better idea i said mm -hmm. so um with painting except for a commission which is very very difficult i just let the painting take its own form so you just said a commission piece is difficult tell us about that because i love doing commission pieces yeah and most artists don't it is um the only way I will do a commission is if someone is very, very familiar with my work, mm -hmm. like they've seen it and they've seen it in various stages. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll go through stages where the work is darker. I'll go through stages where I'm using a heavy, heavy outline. I'll go through stages where the outline disappears. So to kind of go through the work and really get 
an understanding, like when someone says, oh, I like your work, mm -hmm. like to be more specific, like what are the paintings that they're responding to? So I know in a way the flavor of what the commission should look like. And then I've actually asked people to write me a story of their life mm -hmm. or to send me photographs mm -hmm. from their childhood, depending, I, I did uh, some paintings for a family. And so I wanted to get a sense mm -hmm. of the family mm -hmm. and really understand, not just meet the three people who were talking about the painting. So um, I went ahead and did a, a big piece of work. And then I thought, I don't really know if this is the painting that I want to do. So let me do another one and let me do another one that feels more like me. The, the problem is like you have another brain in there, like when you're doing a commission. Mm -hmm. So it's very hard to do the work. I want to do the work so that even if the commission doesn't work as a commission, I have the best painting mm -hmm. that I could have done. Mm -hmm. And so what I'll do is I'll have them come look at it like midway and we'll just kind of talk about it. And there's, you know, if there's some changes that can be made, you know, to make them happier, to make me happier, we can talk about it. But if someone says, oh, that's not it, then um, usually they've just given me money for canvas and now you have a credit for another painting, but mm -hmm. I'm gonna complete this painting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's still, there's some leeway to make some changes. But the main thing is not to do it like a commercial piece of work because I lose the depth of my painting when mm -hmm. I can't go through my own process, which is on a way, in a way like a lonely process, like I'm traveling through a space on my own. What I like about a commission and how I approach it, it's, you know, it, and as you say, you're doing this wonderful figurative work and maybe going to myth and archetypal figures and reading Odysseus and you're having your own experience in a, in a commission piece, you're connecting with someone else, with someone else's energy. And I just love connecting and talking with that person. And then when I'm painting, I feel like I can, I can kind of tap into their energy. Mm -hmm. So it's a whole different process yeah. of tapping into someone else's energy and getting their input. And for me, it's really fulfilling. Well, it can be in, if someone is really, uh, you know, the commissions that I've had are because people are really excited about the work. Mm -hmm. So they're there, they're in that space already. Mm -hmm. And so um, then it is like to do a painting that pleases someone or the best, you know, when someone went like this, yeah. <laughs> when I yeah. showed them the painting, yeah. then I know that yeah. I got, I got to the right place. Like they had a specific story that they were thinking of and I felt I was able to do it and still have it be, you know, my work. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, like I said, the difference between working commercially, which was very satisfying while I was doing it and then trying to move into another kind of work, mm -hmm. you know, and I've been very lucky because I'm a terrible business person to have people who have found the work and then championed me or that someone found it and that led to someone else seeing the work and then that led to someone else seeing the work and that led to a gallery. Mm -hmm. So things like that have happened. And I, always, I feel in my life, if I'm working truly, if I'm doing what I should be doing, those positive things will happen. I totally yeah. agree. So, Joanne, you've gone through a change because you've lived in New York a long time, mm -hmm. and now you're living in the pastoral <laughs> environment of central Pennsylvania, yeah. and that's why we're at the Pajama Factory, because at your barn studio, there's a reliable internet, <laughs> which is why I'm, we're here. I'm saying I'm just about the Amish. <laughs> <laughs> So, so how has this change of location, change in environment changed your work? Uh, uh, there's been a big change. Uh, if I could show you, I don't have anything here, but the work that I was doing, the last work that I was doing in New York had a very grayed out palette. You know, it was kind of gray green and it had mystical things going on. And here, although I'm the furthest thing from a landscape painter, I'm responsive to 
the seasons that they actually happen. Mm -hmm. Like in New York, weather is just like an inconvenience, you know, on your way to the subway. Mm -hmm. But here you're out in it. And I live in this amazing place, you know, and there's forests and ponds. And, you know, I have this huge barn to paint in. And I've just, um, it's opened up a lot of the storytelling, um, the emotional content of the work, and even the palette has changed. My colors are brighter and stronger and, mm -hmm. you know, more, I don't want to say um, more primary colors, but like, you can't see this, but if you look at my palette here, you can see a lot of pure color mm -hmm. on the palette. And I do a lot of the coloration on the canvas. I work wet in paint. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is, although I love New York and I'm from New York and, you know, I'd like to go back there every couple of months, mm -hmm. you know, and go to a museum and see my friends and eat good food and get mm -hmm. shoes. These are important things. <laughs> so, um, but I love the open, the health that I feel living where I live. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just beautiful and open and quiet and healthful. And the amazing thing is, although I thought, you know, when I first moved out here, I kept saying, you're crazy. This is crazy. <laughs> like you're leaving New York and you're a painter. But um, I almost couldn't keep up with the shows that were offered me when I came out here, mm -hmm. which was totally, totally unexpected. Mm -hmm. I thought I'd be painting in the woods for 10 years and no one would talk to me. And then I'd come out with a body of work that was entirely my own language, you know, but I really just have had um, tremendous open doors for me, you know, in terms of being able to show the work and speak about the work and produce the work. So we're coming to a close. So tell me for a woman's voice was the importance of you having your own voice in your work? Well, it's important that to me, that the work is uniquely mine. This is something I need to feel that it's not just, although I'm using universal figures, that what I'm bringing to it is the uniqueness of myself, not to make too much that I'm so unique. We're all unique. We all have something that is only ours. You know, that's sometimes hidden deep. I mean, we live very um, uniform lives sometimes and we do what people do. But one of the things, and I do this in my workshop is to try to get to the place that is simply purely you that you are bringing to the canvas. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping these things that I do have my voice in them that mm -hmm. is not a copy of something else or someone else's work, mm -hmm. that it is in a sense, the work that only I could do, although I'm using symbols that are universal symbols. And that is what I hope. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Uh, Joanne, before we leave, please share with our listeners one more time where they can find out more about you and see some of your work. Okay. Um, I'm represented in San Francisco by Art House. It's A-R-T-H-A-U-S-S-F, I think, San Francisco. Um, it's a gallery that was a physical gallery that's now just an online gallery, but it's holding, uh, representing me there. Uh, I have a Facebook page, um, Joanne Landis Artist, where you can see a whole body of work and also some mini films. And I did do in 2019, a TEDx talk in Williamsport. So hopefully you can access that. Joanne, yeah. thank you so much. And I just, I love how over the course of your career, it just seems you've gone deeper and deeper and deeper into yourself that is then reflected in the work. So congratulations. Thank you. Thanks so much. And, and thank you listeners for being with us on the frequency of creativity where we are at the intersection of energy and art.